we have with us Suchismita Bose from the foundation. Suchismita Bose has completed her master's in clinical psychology from Delhi University. She's already proven her worth as a psychologist in, Delhi Psychiat in the Delhi Psychiatry Center, the Messina Hospital, and New Horizons Child Development Center in Mumbai. Suchismita, the director of the foundation, has been working with the organization since the last six years. She's been instrumental in the development of Project HEAL, which stands for Help Eradicate Abuse Through Learning, that focuses on CSA. She conducts workshops and trainings on CSA, and also does extensive therapy work with CSA survivors. So Chasmita has been invited to give lectures on child rights and child sexual abuse in various colleges, like Symbiosis, Pune, and St. Xavier's in Bombay. Her focus for today is on revisiting trauma, conflicts, and complex recovery in the adult survivors. So Chasmita Bose from the Foundation. So before I start talking about the topic today, um, I'm going to just talk slightly about the work that the foundation has been doing so far. So like we mentioned in the morning, the, uh, the foundation launched Project HEAL in 2008. And ever since we've been doing uh, work on child sexual abuse with a three-pronged approach. One is we do a lot of awareness workshops with parents, teachers, children, and the community. So whether it's in schools, whether it's in clubs, anywhere that we can even get 20 people together, we are happy to talk to them about child sexual abuse. And our awareness workshops range from basic awareness to more intense up to three-day programs which, uh, which could specialize in certain aspects of child sexual abuse. And we go into details about it. So we also do a lot of trainings for therapists who want to work on child sexual abuse but are not yet completely comfortable dealing with the issue. So we work with them as well. Apart from that, we also do a lot of therapy work with survivors of child sexual abuse, whether they're children or adults. Apart from doing therapy work in-house, we also have a panel of therapists across Bombay who work pro bono for us. So depending on the need of the case and the location, we refer these cases out to them. And finally, we also are involved in advocacy work. So we were part of the Mumbai uh, Working uh, Committee that helped draft POXO. So that is another thing that we worked on. And in fact, the idea of the seminar germinated from there because we realized that when you get together and you work together, things actually get done. No matter how much time it takes, it does get done. So that's basically what the foundation has been doing. And um, as a therapist and as working on child sexual abuse, one of the major areas that I have been working on is with adult survivors because we believe very strongly that there's no point in doing awareness with children till you've first worked with the adults around the children. Because if the child is sensitized to the issue and goes and reports it to the parent or a teacher in school and they don't know how to deal with it, it it might be more chaotic for the child. So starting from there, we realized that we needed to do workshops with parents and teachers first. And through that, a lot of the cases that came up were of adults, parents, and teachers who had had similar experiences in their childhood. And we started off with therapy work with them. And that's why I decided that let's talk about our experience in what we have learned in these years in working with adult survivors of child sexual abuse. So the topic that we selected for that is revisiting trauma, conflicts, and complex recovery in adult survivors. So uh, based on my experience, there were certain things that came up for me. So when I was trying to sit and uh, figure what I wanted to talk about today, there were two, three points that I realized that I always try and keep reminding myself of when I work with adults who are survivors of child sexual abuse. There are certain preconditions that I think I need to be constantly reminded of. The first is that it's difficult to disentangle the effects of child sexual abuse from those of other childhood problems. As therapists working on child sexual abuse, or even otherwise, the moment we uh, meet an adult who has, um, and uh, honestly, I think most of us have certain emotional difficulties in our adulthood too, we immediately associate that with the history of child sexual abuse if we get to know about it. But sometimes the cause and effect may not be so clear cut. A lot of the adult emotional disturbances and problems could be a result of other childhood traumas as well. So they could be intertwined and it's not an easy process to disentangle it, but it's important as a therapist to keep that in mind. Because if you're only working on child sexual abuse and relating all the current emotional difficulties of this adult to that, you might be ignoring many other aspects which are equally important for that person which have happened in their childhood. For example, um, 
physical abuse or neglect or even loss of a very important person in the family. For example, uh, there's this case that we had where this woman, she started off coming for therapy because she wanted to talk about child sexual abuse that she had experienced for years when she was growing up. And she came to us because she knew we were working on the issue. And after the first three sessions, I realized that even though she was talking about child sexual abuse out of an hour long session, 40 minutes, she would keep talking about the fact that while she was growing up, she was moved from home to home within her family, within her relatives, because she came from a broken family and parents were constantly at war with each other. She was shifted from one house to the other. And in that process, an uncle realized the vulnerable situation that she was in and sexually abused her. But for her, as much as the abuse was important, this whole process of growing up without a support system and just figuring her way out, in her words, she would say that she grew up like wild grass. There was nothing that could direct her as to which direction to go in. So that was as important, if not more, for her. And we needed to recognize that and understand that some of her emotional difficulties today were related to that aspect as well. OK, next thing that I think is very important to keep in mind is that people have different varying amounts of resilience. So to assume that everyone will take the same amount of time in healing or the same process works for everyone is again not something that we counselors should do because each individual has a different kind of resilience and even though most people have a lot of emotional baggage from their childhood sexual abuse but there are many of us, I mean, considering 53% of Indian children are sexually abused, half of us in this room have possibly gone through it too. But we managed to also lead a fairly content life. So to assume that everyone would be devastated post-sexual abuse, of course, there is emotional baggage which one needs to deal with. But to assume that everyone is going to crumble after that is not a safe assumption to make either. So that brings me to the third point, which is sexual abuse as a child does not automatically condemn a person to a disturbed adulthood. Coming to the conflicts in adult survivors, the first thing that I thought I should talk about and I dedicate an entire slide to that is a guilty secret. When we work with children, we know that uh, most of them do not feel comfortable talking about the abuse because of the grooming process that happens before the abuse happens. So the uh, abuser prepares the child for the abuse and teaches them ways, um, makes sure that the child never talks about it, either by threats or making the child feel that they are responsible for the abuse. So they grow up with this guilt. And that is what leads them to not feel comfortable to talk about it right into adulthood as well. Because to think of it, as we grow up, as a child, maybe you didn't understand what happened and all of those factors. But when you grow up, why do we still find it so difficult to talk about our abuse for a long time? And once we've spoken it, about it, it becomes gradually simpler. But that first time to talk about it, it takes us a while. And why does that happen? Because at some level, we still continue to hold that guilt that that has embedded himself deep in our psyche right at childhood, and we can't get over it. In fact, sometimes when the abuses happen at a very early stage, the child at that point may not even have registered guilt. But as we grow up and we understand and we remember the memories that we've had, that we have from childhood, we make sense of it, we start thinking what, I could have done this to stop it, or I could have done that to make sure this did not happen further. And as you make sense of it as you're growing up, the guilt keeps on increasing instead of reducing. So first is the guilt of not being able to stop the abuse. Second is the fear of exposure. Because as an adult, we need to uh, we constantly feel the need to protect our own secrets and the family's secrets because that's what we've grown up knowing. So the concept of a fairy tale family that our society has provided that there are parents who are loving and caring and then there are children in the family and then there are grandparents and ev everyone is happy and loving is what everyone tries to project all the time. Even if there isn't sexual abuse, every family has its own deep secrets, but no one ever talks about it openly. So as an adult, if I, as an adult survivor, as I'm growing up, I see that everyone around me has these perfect families, whether they do or they don't, at least that's what is projected to me. So I want to project that back outward too, for my own self, 
because I don't want to feel that I don't have it. And I want others to believe that I have it too. So that makes me want to protect this secret of mine. And I hold the guilt of not being able to stop the abuse. So I don't want people to perceive me as weak either or to assume that I wanted to go through this process. So all of these things makes the adult want to protect this guilty secret. Effects of grooming does not wear out. As people who are working on child sexual abuse, all of us talk about the concept of grooming in childhood, that the abuser grooms the child before abuse, but it does not stop there. It extends into adulthood. The abuse and the grooming might have stopped in childhood, but the effects of it has not stopped right into adulthood. Most of our cases that we see, um, when I'm working with these adults, I see how this grooming has become more and more complex as the, as the child has grown into adulthood and matured. So the, the memories they have of not just the abuse, but the things that the abuser said to them or how they prepared the child before the abuse, those things have stayed too. And the child also has said things to himself or herself pre-abuse, post-abuse, between abuse, all of those things together become this complex memory which they might not even remember in sequence by the time all these years have passed. And the grooming gets more and more complex. So for example, um, there's this one case of uh, this man who came to us when he was 42 and he talked about his abuse for the first time uh, when he was 40. And um, when he was talking about his abuse and his experiences, you could see that he, while he narrated what the man, what his abuser was telling him while he was growing up, you could see that the threads of those sentences, sometimes quoting those sentences in his own explanations of who he is today. So his self-concept of who I am were deeply connected to what he was told he is. So, for example, if he was told that, you know, if you, if you don't listen to me or you tell people about this, that you're going to be a bad person. So he has made that more complex. Of course, it has become more complex in his own head over the years. And now, whenever he talks about anybody in his office in a negative manner, he starts punishing himself for it saying that, oh my God, I shouldn't have spoken about what he told me because he told me in confidence and I'm telling people this, I'm a really bad person. So you see how it gets more and more complex. The grooming has still stayed. It just takes different forms gradually. The experiences have been kept secret for so many years as a result of which the consequences are likely to run really deep. So like, that's why it's very important, like Dr. Sen just said, that to deal with child sexual abuse when it happens with the child because it's still fresh. The layers that have accumulated on top of it are lesser. So it's easier to reach to the root cause, to the root of um, whatever your thoughts and belief systems are around it and your perception of the abuse and to work with it directly becomes slightly simpler. As one grows because of your own ways of trying to deal with the abuse and to deal with the memories of it, as one grows up, the layers become more and more. And to remove those layers one by one and go down to the core becomes a tougher challenge. And a lot of times it's even difficult to recognize those connections. Because with, once you believe something, for example, if I grew up believing I'm a bad person because I, I went through sexual abuse, every little evidence that I can find in my environment, which directly or indirectly correlates with my belief system, I accumulate it and I make my beliefs stronger and stronger. So gradually over the years to come down to remove those things and reach down to this belief system that this comes from that experience, to understand that connection becomes tougher with time. And of course the fear of getting the abuser loved ones or own self into trouble because like we know in most cases the abuser is known to the child. So as they grow up it becomes tougher and tougher for them to acknowledge it and to talk about it. For example, there's this lady who came to us. Um, she's a great job, very well educated, very smart lady. And she talked about her abuse for two sessions but would not talk about who was abusing her. And after, by the third session, she finally spoke. So she was in her mid-30s. And she said that her father abused her for eight years when she was growing up. 
and she spoke about it to her mother and she was the only child and her mother was a psychologist and so she so as a daughter she judges her mother even more now that you were a psychologist and you still did not do anything about it she just brushed it under the carpet and now she has reached a point where the mother has passed away it's just her and the father and the father is really ill and she feels that as a daughter it's her responsibility to take care of her father so she still can't talk about the abuse because she can't deal with the dichotomy in her own head that either look at this person as a bad person or i look at him as my father who made a mistake and let it be how do i deal with both in my own head because i already have the whole abuse to deal with so it's it's a choice for her and she chose to just believe that it's my father who did something wrong and that's it he's not he's not going to do it ever again and i have to deal with this relationship now so again that becomes a huge reason for one to have to keep that burden of the secret within you because you don't want to get people into trouble and you can't deal with getting your own self into trouble either some of the other conflicts of an adult survivor um first is a corroded sen sense of self worth obviously uh, when when an abuser is abusing the child there are going to be some negative emotions like shame or guilt or um fear anger all of these things together a uh, lack of trust these things together just come together and they have an effect on your own concept of who you are and your concept of your self worth which stays on into adulthood and almost in most cases of adult survivors we see this happening because the abuser makes the child feel objectified you feel like an object that was used and as you grow up you make sense of it more and more and to not be able to protect yourself adds to that baggage and that sense of being an object just has an effect on your sense of self worth the desire to constantly settle for second best to avoid the spotlight again very interesting because we see this a lot in teenagers actually where they purposely put on weight or wear layers and layers of unattractive clothing or they want they don't want to um given their best performance or they a lot of adult survivors have the problem of either leaving something midway and not completing a task or procrastinating because they feel that once something is over you're in the spotlight because if you've done something well someone notices you and when you are growing up with a history of child sexual abuse you've always wanted the abuser to not come to you you're trying to push that person's attention from you away so that has become layered and complex in your own understanding and now you've reached a point where you don't want anyone to pay attention to you so there are a lot of people who come with eating problems eating disorders or teenagers who just do not want anyone to get attracted to them they will like in we uh, i had this case of this young girl from a south bombay school where there's so much pressure of being thin and looking good from all your peers and this girl her mother brought us um, brought her to me because she was like she does not want to wax or thread which is unnatural for her age and her peers and she's purposely trying to make herself look bad she wears really loose clothing and everything and the reason for that for her as we explored it was because she just didn't want anyone to look at her everyone's eyes should be away self punishment due to the guilt developed during the grooming process so like i said during the grooming process what the abuser says stays with you so obviously because the abuser needs the child to keep the secret they try to put the entire burden of the act onto the child so they might say things to the child to the effect of that you also wanted it or you you took the chocolate from me so why are you saying no to this that was okay to keep a secret why is this not okay okay so all these things where the child starts feeling that of course this i'm equally responsible or i did not say no or i did not go and tell my parent so as you grow up into adulthood this just multiplies and the burden of that keeps increasing so because of that you might end up indulging in self punishment so the child might uh, the child who's grown into an adult now is either into addictions of different kinds or self mutilation or um, make dropouts from schools 
suicidal tendencies, a lot of this surfaces into adulthood because there's so much guilt that one can't deal with. So you feel the need to punish your own self. Because we've grown up in a society where what have we been taught in our moral sense class is guilt means you've done something wrong, something wrong equals to punishment. So if others don't know about this and they can't punish me, I should punish myself is what the concept develops as. Nightmares and flashbacks, again, something that can stay for a long time, but nightmares and flashbacks can reduce significantly with therapeutic aid. So there's this uh, another case of a man who was 50 when he first talked about his sexual abuse, and uh, he came in with his girlfriend. So he was 50, he was dating this girl for 20 years, but he still couldn't marry her because of his trust issues in life related to his past sexual uh, abuse issues. So when he came in for therapy with his, his girlfriend came in with him, and while we were talking, he mentioned that even today, after all these years, he was abused when he was 15, even today after all these years, no one can touch him to wake him up. Because the moment someone touches him to wake him up, he has a flashback of the memory that the, uh, the older boys in school used to wake him up in the night to sexually abuse him and sodomize him. So that flashback continues right up to now. So you have to go into the other room, call out his name loudly to wake him up. So these things can go on for a long time, but flashbacks and nightmares with therapy, with some sort of guided imagery and relaxation techniques can be reduced. Relationship problems, because of course there's a lot of trust issues that develop because if the abuser is known to the child uh, and as you grow up, it just multiplies that this person has betrayed your trust, family members around you have betrayed your trust. So all these trust issues go on to develop into relationship issues. Like I just told you of this man who could not marry his girlfriend because he just did not trust that if I marry, that this the sanctity of our relationship will continue. So he just was happy to be with her and she was luckily for him, was supportive enough to understand that and be with him. But a lot of them keep testing their partners too. They will try to test to see whether you're really trustworthy. They will do things to check whether, in fact, even with the therapist. Like I've seen for this one young girl who came to me, in the first session, just to check whether she can trust me or not, she kept telling me how bad I was. This is in the first session when we haven't done any work. She just kept telling me how horrible I was just to check whether I still continue to talk to her. And once she established that, the next test that she put up for me is that she told me in the second session, I'm not sure if I'm coming to you for therapy because I need therapy or because I'm attracted to you. So she tried to see if I get slightly scared by a comment like that. So these tests keep happening because you need to reestablish that trust. Problems with sexual functioning, because of course sexual abuse is a traumatic experience, so it can have various kinds of effects on sexual functioning. So it can make the experience of sex very painful. And of course, because there's guilt, a lot of women in particular, because there's a lot of guilt, they, when they engage in adult consensual sexual relationships, they find it difficult to reach an orgasm because they think that getting pleasure out of sex is not correct, is not the right thing to do. So there's a lot of guilt which gets associated with it and they, they don't want to enjoy sex anymore. Or Sexual identity can also become a confusing aspect, especially for men, because if a man has been abused by a male abuser, then all kinds of questions arise right at childhood, which can stay on into adulthood, about why did he choose me? Or, you know, why me over my sister? So all kinds of questions can arise, which might not get resolved because we do not talk about sex openly and definitely not about sexual identity. So it stays on and the confusions stay on. And uh, finally, anger, despair and depression. Of course, very uh, understandable cause um, effects of child sexual abuse where um, Anger, again, is not just necessarily directed towards the abuser and the caretakers. It can be just intense anger that's been bottled up, and you just need to throw it out. 
There was this one case of, uh, again, a man who came to us and he, while we were working through his therapy, one of his main problems was road rage. He's like, I have unexplained, an unexplainable road rage and it's so bad that nobody, n none of my family members or relatives want to travel in the car that I'm traveling. And he's like, I'm, I, it affects me too. Why is this happening? And as we looked at it, we realized that his road rage was because of the sexual abuse that he went through in, in childhood where he felt so helpless every time he was sexually abused. And as a boy, and he was in an army school where he felt that he needed to be strong and masculine because everyone else wanted to be that. And when he was being sexually abused by the hostel warden, he kept feeling the sense of powerlessness as a man. And he could not do anything about it then. And he's bottled up all that anger. And now every time on the road, someone crosses his path at the wrong time or just like uh, hits his car slightly, he feels that these people are looking at me as helpless, as a helpless person. So all that anger that was directed towards that warden comes out here. So you see how since childhood till adulthood, the same issues stay, but the manifestations sort of change. And to be able to recognize that manifestation is primary because half of therapy happens right at that. Acknowledging these manifestations and making those connections usually help the client a significant deal. Moving on to complex recovery. So as we look at some of the issues, next comes how do we work through therapy? And the first thing is starting the process. While we start therapy, in most cases, why do adult survivors even come to talk about it? In most instances, it's just sort of to offload because it's just been so long that they've kept this within them and they need a safe space to just talk about it and unburden themselves. And when they come in to do that, they mostly do not have a clear goal in mind. So that is something that as a therapist working on child sexual abuse, we need to keep in mind because one of the key things that you learn as a therapist is to establish the goal right at the beginning of therapy. But when you're working with adult survivors, you may not be able to do that right at the start because the, the, the survivor may not be sure of what they want to achieve yet. So sometimes this goal of therapy evolves after some time. It takes a little time to figure out what it is beyond just unburdening yourself that you want to achieve. Do you just want to like let out all your anger and get get that out of your system? Or do you want to have a different perception to how you want to move on in life? Now, what is it that you want to achieve? It's something that needs to be established, but it might take a little longer than the first session. Sometimes survivors just need to unburden themselves. Uh, persuasion versus coercion. So sometimes uh, we've seen that after a few sessions of therapy, the, we need to encourage an adult survivor to be able to talk about their experiences outside of just the therapy situation, to feel that it is not a guilty secret that they need to protect and that they can talk to, doesn't have to be with family members to start with, whoever it is, that to be able to feel comfortable to talk about this experience without feeling guilty about it or burdened by it or embarrassed by it. Because like you know, I mentioned earlier that many other childhood problems could also have similar effects as child sexual abuse when you look at adult symptoms. But the difference between other crises and child sexual abuse is that you can talk about most of the other crisis situations. But child sexual abuse is laden with a lot of embarrassment. So you keep that within you. So as therapy progresses, it's important to try and get the survivor to be able to talk about it more outside of the therapy situation. And when you're doing that, we need to be careful to not persuade them but maybe to coerce them. So coercion is okay, but persuasion, sorry, persuasion is okay, but coercion is not okay. Uh, and you can persuade them with, of course, the right kind of skills and also make sure they are at the right emotional level of stability before they start talking about it. So as a therapist, you need to recognize that point in therapy too. Developing trust and maintaining it, like I told you, the, t the client always tries to test you and see whether you can be trusted. So after you have passed that test, you also need to maintain that trust. 
So that is also a challenge which we need to constantly remind ourselves of because the client will keep testing you, the survivor will keep testing you again and again. It's not just a one-time test that you have passed. Issues of confidentiality, yes, because you might need to tell some people about this to get the right kind of help. For example, if the person, if, you're, if the if survivor has any other sort of significant problems, like any physiological problems or sexual dysfunctions, which needs to be addressed by a medical professional. So then in those cases, you need to take advice of other people too. So that time confidentiality is, becomes an issue. So you need to discuss that with the client. Crisis intervention, very important, because when we work with adult survivors, we assume that the incident has happened really long ago. So now when they're talking about it, it's just offloading or unburdening. But sometimes at this time, in fact often at this point, because they're talking about it for the first time, or they might have been reminded of the entire process for the first time after years, there might be a crisis for that person. And at that time, crisis intervention is important. So therapy can wait for a bit. At that time, making sure that the client is safe, there are no suicidal attempts, or there's no physiological damage that they can, they can um, put on themselves, or they're fine safety-wise, and there's the right kind of support system when they go back home, is important to look at before you start dealing with the more graver issues and deeper issues that they already have. And there may be a need to see a specialist, therapist, or a doctor, depending on what the complications are. Setting boundaries, a very important concept, because often in therapy, we sometimes might feel flattered that the, that the survivor has chosen you as the first person to talk about this big secret that they've kept within themselves. And while you feel flattered about this, you might overdo your role as a therapist. So there was this one counselor, school counselor, who called me once in the middle of the night because she didn't know what to do with this 13-year-old girl who was going through sexual abuse and spoke about it to this counselor. And this counselor was feeling so bad about it that she gave her her personal mobile number. And this girl would keep calling her at 12 in the night, 1 in the night. And the counselor didn't know how to handle it because she would speak to her three to four hours in a day. So which is not OK, because what you're doing is you're making the client completely dependent on you. And this person already has boundary issues because child sexual abuse is a violation of personal boundaries. So if you are able to say no as a therapist, you are also a model for that person to feel that it is OK to say no. So you are becoming a model for that. So setting boundaries is very crucial. The concept of an inner child. For adult survivors, when they recollect their memories, it's a process that you can go through with them because when you've gone through the abuse as a child, a part of you might split within you. You have grown up as an adult, but a part of you which suffered as a child might have remained as a child. So you've not, if, you, if the adult has not been able to integrate that part of themselves with the adult part of themselves, they're not able to forgive themselves. A lot of guilt arises because of that. You are holding the child within you to blame, but you are operating out of an adult mind and thinking this could have been done and that could have been done, but you were a child when it happened. So to integrate the two and understand that that was a part of me which was a child which did this. And also sometimes you see with a lot of adult survivors that very um, childlike emotions come up. Extremely impulsive, erratic behavior uh, and emotions of a child come up in them because a part of them has remained a child and a part of them has grown up. So to be able to integrate the two is a very crucial step in therapy and that can be done through guided imagery under relaxation or something where you where the person can be made to uh, imagine the child part of themselves and talk to that and forgive the adult part and the child part for whatever they hold themselves responsible for and throughout the anger have that conversation and integrate the two and also convince the child in you that now I'm an adult and I can take care of you so you don't need to be scared anymore so that kind of an integration can happen. Disclosures and confrontations, often clients, uh, survivors of, adult, uh, of child sexual abuse, they want 
they need to speak to other family members, sometimes maybe their partners about the sexual abuse. So it's good to encourage them, but make sure that they do it at a time when they're emotionally stable. Also, if they feel the need to confront the abuser, if the abuser is still alive, then it can either be done directly or it can be done even through a role play if they don't want to do it up front. So it can be done in a therapeutic safe situation or first it could be done there and then done directly with an abuser. So both ways, but it's important to always make the survivor aware of the fact that when you disclose or talk about your abuse with anybody now, the no, it's not necessary that you will get the kind of responses that you are expecting. There can be adverse consequences and for them to be prepared for that. So as a therapist, we need to be uh, aware of that and make the survivor aware of it before any disclosures happen. And finally, some learnings as a therapist. Sometimes giving literature to read about child sexual abuse can help some adult survivors because most of them are rational, smart, in, intelligent beings who, after a point of in therapy, want to learn more and you can't talk about everything within the therapy situation, so you can give them some material that they can read about and imbibe in, them, in them, themselves. Group therapy also works for some clients, so after you've worked significantly in individual therapy and you have a few clients who are at sort of the similar st uh, stage in therapy and it's a homogeneous group, you could put them together. That kind of sharing sometimes helps. Therapists and survivors' perspective towards the abuser might be different. Again, a very important thing to keep in mind. As a therapist, and especially if you're working as a social worker and as a therapist, your perception of what the abuser is can be very different from what the survivor's abuse, um, perception of the abuser is. So to be aware of that and know when to say what and not impose your perceptions on that person is, is very important. And finally, it's very important to take care of yourself as a therapist, which comes from even the boundary violation part. Because the more you allow the boundaries to be violated, the higher the chances of burnout. And also child sexual abuse is, is a very complex thing to work with and it's not something that many of us are comfortable working with. So if you don't have the kind of confidence to work on every case, depends on the nature of the case, try and you must get additional support from people around you because you should not allow yourself to burn out and if you don't take care of yourself, you and, your, and the survivor both suffer. So it's very crucial to take care of yourself, to not sympathize and to keep in mind that you only need to empathize but not sympathize with the survivor. So that's again a very crucial thing to keep in mind. That's all if questions, if there are any. Support groups for the therapist or for survivors, the survivors. for the survivors. To be honest, um, just like group therapy. Are you talking about that? No, that's, you know, like a lot of people who may who may have been abused as kids want to get together, but everybody is so scared that the other would know that they've been abused. Yes. So you do yes. s start these survivor afternoons, mm. and you end up being the only one there, and nobody coming for weeks. Together. I agree. It's not easy, which is why I said that it. It has to be after substantial amount of individual therapy and all of them have to be at the same, more or less same level in the process of therapy to feel comfortable. Honestly, I've only managed to get one group together with three people. That's it so far because people on, like you said, it's, they're not very comfortable, which is I think okay, which is fine. If, when they feel that they're at that stage, a lot of them, what they, they may not feel comfortable to come in for group therapy, but they're happy to come and work in an NGO setup or something where they can work with other survivors and gradually find their space to talk about it. So that happens often. I have a question. Yes. Uh, why it is so difficult for the adult survivor to overcome uh, uh, CSA uh, from a known person compared to the unknown person? In therapy? Yeah, even in the therapy right. or in life. How, right. Why it is so difficult? Because if the, if the 
person has grown up hmm. uh, from any kind of uh, child sex abuse from a known person and versus, versus uh, some unknown right so why it is becoming because of trust because when it is a known person for a child versus an adult there is an automatic connection where you assume that the known person is there to either take care of you or is responsible for you in some way so the feeling of betrayal of trust when it comes to a known person is much bigger much stronger as compared to an unknown person because with an unknown person you have no expectations but with a known person you have expectations of certain kind of protection which does not happen so when there's be- breach of trust which happens which as you grow up you make sense of it even more so that's why it's tougher to overcome um overcome the fact that a, a known person could have abused me that's the main reason actually um um i wanted to ask a question more sir, 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 hi uh you got to get to know each other just two days let's just be fearless about that let's just let's talk about ourselves here please hi i'm uh, shruti from uh, tis um i wanted to ask more about children than uh, adult survivors mm. uh, because we've been talking about starting conversations on violence but um, there is one very taboo topic even within uh counseling circles of child sexuality itself because children are seen as desexualized and it is uncomfortable to uh, talk about uh, sexual choices so is it has have you ever had conversations on positive sexual choices or positive sexual experiences with children or even adults who had say experienced abuse as well as um, positive sexual uh, experiences in their childhood and has that alongside like simultaneously along with violence has that conversation happened within the moralistic society that we live in it is difficult yes to have those so i completely all. agree with you it's very difficult to have that because and the problem lies of course with the adult community because we don't children don't have a concept of what is right and wrong until we tell them so because we associate sexuality with taboo and shame so children are taught that we don't want to talk to them about it that's why they are not open to listening to us about it but they of course want to know because every child is curious about this one thing that you don't want to talk to them about so it's actually tougher to talk to adults about their sexual experiences than with children so when we go into schools and talk to children about sex sexuality and sexual abuse children are a lot more open and receptive to the whole conversation as opposed to when we talk to the parents and the teachers within the same school so they are a lot more constrained in what they will say and they measure every word because they fear judgment because they are judging themselves and they also fear that everyone else will judge them so it's tougher to actually have that conversation with the adults with children it's a, it's far simpler Hi uh my name is Rishi again yes. and I was just wondering as a therapist what are your your views about this when I come into a therapy room I'm imagining that I'm stepping into a safe space where everything is safe and nothing can harm me and that's why I'll open up but is it a good idea then uh to get the abuser to be a part of that space and have a confrontation with uh, the survivor ever I know the uh, I mean the, for me right now as I ask this question the answer is it's always going to be different for every survivor but is there a <laughs> uh it's it's a it's a very rare thing that even a survivor wants to do honestly in my experience I have not so far had any survivor who wants to bring the abuser into that space of the therapy situation and confront them because a uh, this is their safe space so they don't want to bring that person into this be they are not sure that this that the person the abuser will come in here because they don't want to be confronted by the survivor and to add to it a professional or whoever it is so they do not want to come into that space so it's a rare thing that a survivor would even want but if there was an off chance that that would happen it would have to happen after like significant amount of therapy where the the it's finally comes down to what is important for your client 
so if that is what they really need at that point then you could do that but it has to be after a lot of therapy doing enough role plays understanding what the consequences of this is going to be after that if they still choose that then that's okay okay thank you